Okay, while you sit, I first of all start by thanking uh, Stefano and Anita for inviting me. Um, Stefano said that I, back in the years, have founded the um, Ethics and Values Group. That is incorrect. I was just part of a group of uh, people who thought that within the ASOP community, the um, theme of ethics and values indeed was a bit underrepresented, even though it was horizontal throughout all the other working groups. And so we have cited out a specifically dedicated group. Stefano has inherited it indeed some years ago, and then Anita joined, and it fills my heart with joy to see that this group is alive and kicking, and way better than we left it uh, when I decided to step out of it. So, uh, second. Um, when uh, I was informed that the um, theme of this thematic working group for today would have been that of conformorality, um, I panicked a little because what it is expected from a keynote speaker is uh, making the point on a given topic in a given discipline in a point of time. So I'm extremely thankful <laughs> that soon later Matteo has accepted the invitation because this is exactly what he has done for all of us. He showed us the state of art of the applied research and also the theoretical debate around conformality, and I'm very thankful for it. I also have a couple of questions, but I hold them for later. So a reason on what my contribution could be. And um, whereas it is expected from a keynote indeed to do what I just said, I thought to do something different. Um, which is just as a colleague, sharing the story of how, as a planning scholar, arrived uh, to explore and dig into the debate on conformality, uh, which I have been doing for the past uh, some years, and uh, coincidentally uh, also sharing with uh, Stefano at times in the past, etc. So mine is a personal account that I'm sharing with you as a colleague, hoping to inspire the debate that follows from my presentation. And the last good news is that I'm also keeping it very short. We have a gold standard in the Netherlands, 20 minutes, and you must be done. Okay, I start um, not to be self-referential, but just to offer myself as an example of uh, a scholar in our community. I don't even know whether I am a scholar, prop no, in the strict sense, but um, I will use this term not in the formal connotation, but just someone who's exactly like all of us in this room, study planning. And in my case, my specific field is planning theory. So uh, these are the dates uh, that mark my education. So I enter high school, enter university, enter my PhD, enter my postdoc. So here you see the big phases of my academic formation. I come from a high school in Italy that at the time was heavily invested in philosophy and history of the history of the arts. So we had like seven hours every week of philosophy, history and history of the arts, which I'm thankful for because it gave me kind of a solid background um, in philosophy. Um, the boxes that you see here is just a simple, non-empirical, but reliable representation of how big was the representations of the philosophers whose names are in the boxes throughout my education. It is a retrospective self-reflection on what are the foundations of my philosophical training. So from day one at the high school, which I described being a specific type of high school, all the books, the handbooks, the lessons, the reasonings, were heavily informed by structuralism and Marxism, whether this was done explicitly or not. So mine is a, is a retrospective reasoning. But I can definitely say that if there is a philosopher who I can cite by heart pages and books and writings throughout many other authors that I was offered for my education, is definitely Karl Marx. I had to arrive to start my PhD, 2003, to expand a bit, uh, let's say, the building blocks. So obviously I've studied way more than these philosophies, the philosophers like all of you, but here are really the building blocks of my formation, to start it to study Jürgen Habermas. 
I come later to why it's important in my information. Then uh, the sociologist in this case, but a sociologist who also was a philosopher, that really was the building block of my PhD, was Ulrich Berg, author of The Risk Society. Maybe you heard about this book, but I will say some words about it later. And I had to arrive here in 29. I was 32 years old by then to hear for the first time about other important philosophers. So that's my postdoc at the Institute of Applied Ethics of Delft University of Technology, where I had the great luck of attending uh, the um, research school in ethics, which is a Dutch research school in ethics shared by all the universities. And there I was exposed to the writings of John Rawls, I was exposed to the writings of Amartya Sen, an economist who also uh, produced political philosophy uh, reflections, Marta Nussbaum, and all of them are here in the pictures on the side. But I had to arrive here in 2011, so even older than that, to hear about someone called Friedrich Hayek, the father of classic liberalism, not in the political connotation, as you know, but the first scholar who has applied complex system theory to the analysis of social phenomena, which is an entirely different angle through which looking at his scholarly production, of course. First question, how is it possible that a person desperately in love with philosophy, who has attended and chosen throughout her path, always from the high school to my PhD to my postdoc, always to um, develop herself into philosophy schools in one way or the other, has learned about someone so absolutely important in the development of thought of the 20th century to date in 2011. So when I was by then 35 almost, no, 35, 35 years old, it's a lot. So my whole academic formation had already taken place. And it had taken place uh, throughout, indeed, in a very synthetic form through three major building blocks. Karl Marx. So I had learned for 20 years by then that social phenomena and conflicts of class are determined by the capitalistic structure of society. Easy peasy. <laughs> Ulrich Beck, more sophisticated, that arrived with my PhD because Ulrich Beck takes this worldview and makes it doing a step forward by saying capitalism, the social structure, which according to Marx is the economic modes of production, creates not only inequalities, but also catastrophic risks. Obviously, Beck writes in a different point in history compared to Marx, when a couple of nuclear bombs had already devastated an entire country, and technology was showing how the fast developments that were accompanying technological development were also resulting in the debates that started in the 80s when he was writing regarding environmental pollution, major industrial accidents, etc., etc., etc. But what, from the point of view of the worldview, Beck does, it takes Marx, transposes it to the world of the 80s, of the 20th century, and says, wait a moment, not only we produce inequalities, we also produce man-made catastrophic risk. Man-made is very gender biased, but I'm using his words here. And then, Jürgen Habermas. This is way more relevant to planning, because Mr. Habermas was offered to me as a material of study when, next to the research school in ethics in the Netherlands, during my PhD, I also attended for a period the research school in spatial planning. Uh, research schools in the Netherlands are PhD schools that are shared among various faculties and universities. Why I consider Habermas a building block of my formation? Because Habermas is about in line with the pillar of the Marxian worldview, but he puts it in a different context again which is how do we form rational judgments? Patsy Healy, who has dominated 
planning theory for the past 30 years with her collaborative planning theory. All the students in the bachelor learn collaborative planning theory, paradigm. Patsy Healy, in an uh, article of 2003, says herself that she draw on Habermas to arrive to her conception of collaborative planning, which is basically the transposition of the following idea. Because we all have different values at stake, we have to sit around the table drinking coffee and talk until we do agree and we find a way in between, and therefore, in this way, a rational decision in some way will emerge that will be reflective of our negotiated consensus. This is Patsy Healy. But to arrive to say that, she passed through Habermas. On a philosophical level, what Habermas done is a bit more sophisticated because what he's saying in opposition to John Rawls is that the rationality is not behind the veil of ignorance. We don't need logic devices up there in the hyperuranium to arrive to formulate rational judgments because rational judgments occur in the world of matter. So the building blocks of my formation always originated in one way or the other from here. And I arrived to be 35, not knowing it, because I never was offered an alternative. So my mind programming was entirely channeled by the worldview that I didn't even know that I had. Then, because we grew up, two things happened, in particular two encounters. One encounter happened in 29. I traveled to Southeast Asia. I took a, a sort of a gap year from academia. I was about to defend my PhD thesis. Didn't really know what I wanted to do next. I accepted a job from an environmental consultancy to go to Southeast Asia and doing the auditing of oil palms estates. You know, the whole debate of oil palm, how bad it is, blah, blah, blah. I thought it was adventurous, and I also thought, okay, let's really walk with my legs into the world rather than staying, studying and quacking my head on the wall. And so I did it. During one of these audits, I have met Amina. Amina was, hopefully still is, an Indonesian worker, a woman, way younger than me at the time, um, and she was working in one of these oil palms estates. Obviously, for respect, I haven't put her photo. This is my arm. When I take a photo in her shed, I wouldn't know how to define it, where she had hanged this mirror, probably fallen or stolen from a truck in the fields that she was using for herself to adjust her scarf. She was a Muslim worker. So that's me back then taking a photo in her own shed. Why the encounter with Amina was so um, foundational for everything that I became afterwards? Because Amina confronted me with something that I had never seen with my eyes, even though I had studied Marxism, all these schools of thoughts in Marxism, Orthodox, Neo-Marxism, uh, whatever, classical Marxism. But I am a European. So my notion of poverty and inequality and I, by the way, coming from the working class, so sharing that working class background, my notion, my um, experience of poverty was still an experience of dignity. I myself, coming from the working class, had access to a tertiary education, I had access to public schools, um, I could cultivate my own aspirations, not being well off, but having a whole social system that sustained me to do that. So my thinking of poverty was still the thinking that we sometimes still today romanticize in society. Ah, oh, back then we were poor, but we were so happy. That was my notion of poverty. Amina was a big slap in the face for me because the distance between what I would have considered poverty and her poverty was gigantic undescribable. She was a woman way younger than me, working 16 hours a day in a estate for a multinational company of a Malaysian location. We were in Kuching, Malaysia, owned by a Chinese corporation. 
And she was uh, having, she had already two children who were living in a shed where no natural light could enter during the day because we, we are on the equatorial line. So she had used uh, uh, plastic bags to kind of envelop from, from within her shed because the sun wouldn't filter, otherwise they would burn alive. Um, her poverty wasn't poverty with dignity. It was really on the edge of extreme poverty. And that for me was a big shock because it brought me, at some point I realized, I had a moment in which something snapped in my head and I said, this is what Marx was describing in 1948, back in Paris, visiting the slums of the neo just born working class that were living in the same conditions that Amina was living in in 29. 2009. So that for me was a sort of concretization, materialization before my eyes that that poverty exists and that the distance between me and her was sidereal. Nothing could have ever, ever bridged the distance of means and opportunities between me and her. I came back to Holland. I resigned from the company in one week. <laughs> I said, okay, fine, I'm done. I go back to academia and I go on with my postdoc and I want to become an academic and this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. 2011, two years later, end of my postdoc and first year of tenure track in Wageningen University. A seminar on the then kind of under construction theme of the Just City gets organized in Utrecht. A colleague of mine that then became a um, colleague of mine, also in the, in the institute where I work now, invites me. Just a small group of people, we were like, I think, six, um, discussing the theme of the Just City. There was also a professor invited, a classic liberal scholar, I could define him who, during his contribution to this seminar, imagine just a table of a few people talking, on a flow chart, writes the following sentence. Inequality in itself is not a morally relevant problem. It infuriated me. And thankfully, <laughs> because um, I do not conform to the authority much, I keep the boiling inside myself for the whole speech. He arrived to give an example that outraged me. And the example was, well, if inequality of conditions, economic conditions, would be a problem in itself, then we should also be morally outraged from, um, by the difference between a potential Silvio Berlusconi and a potential Bill Gates, because also between them there is a big difference. Infuriated. I go home that day. Well, I first engage in a fight during the seminar itself. Then I go home that day and I write an email which I still have, fully dedicated to Amina. And I write to this professor when I was in Southeast Asia and I was next to Amina and I've learned, but you are a European centric, you don't understand, blah, blah, blah. It is so unjust. But because this professor is someone that um, for whom I had an enormous esteem, I thought, okay, three years. I gave myself three years. I had just started my tenure track. I had to run two courses. The tenure track was relatively stable. I always um, uh, refused to subscribe to the publish or perish credo in academia. I always thought that you only have to write when you have something to say. And that has been a topical moment in my career in which I realized that I had nothing to say. I was confused and I needed to retire myself into studying deeply to understand how someone could say that inequality in itself is not morally relevant. And Jack, I all my time and resources into going back to study Marx's original manuscripts and many, many, many more authors. But the author in particular on which the scholar was drawing was Friedrich Hayek. Again, um, a major scholar of the 20th century that for 20 years nobody bothered to even mention during one of my philosophy classes. So I bought all the books. I bought Bruno Leone's books, a famous Italian liberal scholar. 
I bought the Derdre McCloskey books, the Chicago School in Economics. So I, I filled my entire room with books and I put myself down with my hat and I kept studying for three years. What did I very synthetically <laughs> came to conclude in those three years? Well, the first, I started to understand that planning literature, also literature produced by a couple of the names that I have just shared, is full of misunderstandings and misconceptions regarding the most basic philosophical notions. And even worse than that, I had complied with that until this before three crazy years in which I haven't published a single line and I just closed up myself in a room studying. For example, a typical one in planning theory is the notion of individualism, which is used, and that's unforgivable, not in the philosophical connotation that Hayek gives in his own writings, the individual as the building block and the um, atomic, the, the, the individual as the, the being entitled to rights. But individualism, as we connote it in the ordinary language, you are individualistic, huh? you're moved by self-interest, huh? you're selfish. This was, for me, an eye-open moment that was, um, I'm still shaking when I think of it, because I started to read literature in planning theory with an understanding that so many fundamental philosophical notions were used and still are using it as we use them in the ordinary language, rather than digging into their philosophical meaning and also the philosophical context and debate in which those notions were born. Um, obviously, the epitome of the wrong use or the misconceived use uh, notion is definitely the notion of equality, but that we see later. Um, inequality, though, it's, I decided to elect because of the speech of the scholar back in 2011. I also decided at some point to elect equality and inequality as my case study. And I thought, OK, now I have to design a couple of studies in which I try to at least look at it from multiple perspectives, which is something that in planning theory we tend not to do. Um, because, as we all know, there is a growing obsession with documenting inequalities on the urban social level, but very little interest in arguing why inequalities will be wrong on the moral level. I didn't want to put it on the slide, but I have a concrete example here, which is Fanham latest book, Fanham et al. latest book, Urban Inequalities. It's published open access. There is no student in the Netherlands who doesn't bump onto this book since it was published some years ago. And it is a thorough collection of descriptive studies on main world cities in which it is documented visual in visual forms, in quantitative forms and in qualitative forms, urban inequalities measured as here are the rich, here are the poor, here are the bit less rich, this is it, here there is gentrification, blah, blah, blah. But there is no single line in the book, even though obviously the taste of the book is this is very wrong, but there is not a single line in the book that says why it's wrong. It's a purely descriptive book on urban inequalities. And it's becoming what for me was Marx when I was a young student, is becoming that book for the new generation of planning students in the Netherlands. Um, here we come to something a bit more complex. At the end of this whole journey, Methodological challenge from, I teach methodology, theory and methodology. So my, my own methodological challenge at that point was to design studies that could um, uh, demonstrate is too strong, but that, that could uh, show exactly what I just described, that there are lots of notions in planning literature that are used in their ordinary language connotation and not in their philosophical connotation, and not even in the context of their generation in the various authors that I've mentioned. It was searching for this robust methodological approach that one day I have bumped onto the concept of conform morality. And um, that was one of the 
enlightening moments in which I thought, wait a moment, what if in the planning theory community, in fact, we are not digging into the true meanings of what we write and what we think simply because we conform to what? Patti Healy, uh, all the school of thought of participatory planning, collaborative planning theory, say to us. What, what if what is in fact happening in our scholarly community is that because of the recognized expertise of some scholars, their omnipresence in the AESOP congresses, they give the keynote speeches, they write the book, they are in the, in the editorial board of all the main journals. What if in fact I was the victim myself until this enlightening uh, moment? What if I was the victim myself was just me conforming to them instead of just thinking with my own head? Um, I think that uh, this conforming instead of thinking with my own hand, uh, with my own head, has been true for uh, I have to say the longest part of my career. And sometimes uh, it just needs to have one or two encounters to realize that that is the case. That is just to say, how did I arrive to uh, conformorality? Conformorality as a notion didn't solve my methodological design. I come to that at the end. But it proved me that I was on the right conceptual part. Maybe we are just conforming, guys, when we do keep saying urban inequality is wrong, gentrification is wrong, and this is bad, and blah, blah, blah. Um, this is the article uh, that didn't make me famous, <laughs> but uh, it's the result of the first three years of, uh, now, in Italian we would say Studio Matto e Disperatissima from Leopardi's poetry. So studying, studying, studying. Um, and I'm not here just because I want to self-refer myself, but I'm here for another reason. And it is that this article in itself is an empirical demonstration of everything that I just said. So basically, uh, because I, I mean, I have towers of original writings of Marx and I studied it very well. At some point I realized that Marx concept of human significance is only an example that I want to give you, informs multiple schools of thoughts in political philosophy and also in geography. In particular, I was struck by noticing that David Harvey, the right to the city, neoliberalism, and blah, 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 who self-defines himself as a Marxist scholar, heavily draws on this uh, Marxian literature. And also, even without, not explicitly, but implying it, also a Marx notion of human significance. But also Martha Nussbaum, who is a liberal egalitarian political philosopher, um, a scholar with Amartya Sen of the Rawlsian schools of thought, so an egalitarian, but still a liberal. Also, Martha Nussbaum draws very much on Marx's human significance. So departing from this common source, they do develop to very different lines of thought. And their difference is that once I've made an experiment in my master, advanced master class of students who have been studied like you quite a lot, I said, raise your hand if you know David Harvey. Raise your hand if you ever heard of Martha Nussbaum. No one. When the peer review process started, I was rejected this article three times. Um, basically, the thesis that I do defend in the article in a very synthetic form is, it's not because um, Marx, in, Marx interpretation of this concept, it's not only engendering uh, the conclusions that Harvey draws, there are also equally valid but other conclusions that the liberal school of thought generates by reading Marx, but nobody talks about it in our own scholarly field. The article was rejected three times, and the first time it was not only rejected very badly and severely, but one of the peer reviewer wrote this sentence. This is a snapshot from the peer review. I am put off by the critics to Harvey. Would you believe it, that the study that cost me three years of my time and passion and involvement, consultations with all my peer community, was rejected because the peer reviewer was offended that I was daring to criticize David Harvey. This peer review led me to uh, start for the first, hopefully last time, a process of appeal to the journal in which I wrote 
2,000 pages, 2,000 words of rebuttal, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I passed through the peer review, but I think it's significant that it cost me so much just to put this article forward. Um, this is the second article uh, on which I have been writing, on which I've been working for the past uh, some years. There has been a pandemic in between. Personal circumstances also that prevented me from taking to conclusion. But it is the 21, 2021 article that draws on comfort morality that Stefano uh, and I discussed back in Utrecht when he was invited. This is the final table of contents. And to close, what is the title? On the moral irrelevance of urban inequality. Um, it's a public still, it's still undergoing uh, peer review. Probably I will go through a number of rejections, but I'm very happy that I was able to take it to conclusion. What is my take home message? Two. First, one, um, no, many more years and one commitment. Mm -hmm. What is my uh, main take home message for a working group um, that are so vital? Working groups are very vital within the ASOP community because they do group the next generation of urban scholars. They are the pumping heart of the association, very much. Um, first, we have a responsibility, pedagogic and also personal and scholar, as scholars, we have a responsibility not just to teach the theories to our students, but to teach them what's behind the theory. So whenever I start my courses, I always use this image and I say, okay, so the glasses are the theory, and what the glasses make you seeing is the problem. According to the theory, you will formulate the problem differently. But the most fundamental part are the eyes behind the glasses, because the eyes behind the glasses, it's you. It's the worldview that you have behind your glasses. In my case, as I said, for the longest part of my academic journey, those glasses were hard orthodox Marxism, and I didn't even know it. I had to reflect on that retrospectively to understand and appreciate that for 20 years, that is what, what I was raised with. And to kind of reflect critically on that and to learn new things, I have spent the best part of the past years. I would have been very nice <laughs> if someone have, would have exposed me to a diversity of worldviews along my formation, instead of growing me within one general school of thought. Um, worldviews, theories, and evaluation is my master course. As I said, I do not subscribe to the publisher parish. Uh, academics shouldn't be judged and should, most importantly, never conform to the idea that you are a prolific scholar according to the number of papers that you publish, but to what you write in those papers. And the second biggest commitment, what we can do, all of us here, the second biggest commitment is in fact creating um, educational opportunities for the students that show them a diversity um, of worldviews. This is a slide, exact, the exact reproduction of slide from one of my courses, which is uh, Planning Theory and Methodology. And it's just an example of what I do try to expose my students to, opposite worldviews. So I, I explain to them Marx very well, how does he see social phenomena? And I then oppose Friedrich Hayek, how does he see planning phenomena? Always using a correct philosophical language without creating misunderstandings of notions. What is real individualism, philosophically speaking? What is materialism? philosophically speaking, and so on. Um, it doesn't matter at the end of my courses what the students arrive to write in their essay. It doesn't really matter whether I agree, I agree with them or not. Yeah. I find my role as an educator a success when my students decide freely where do they want to stand. And that's my contribution to the discussion of today. Thank you.